to work at a liquor store in high school in Canyon Country. Uh, and there was a police officer that would go in there, and he was a fucking asshole. And they used to have these tubes of jerky in the front mm-hmm. of the thing, and long like that. I'd put them in my culo and walk around ah, ah, for like five ah, minutes. Ah, and then I would put them back in the tube. But I put them in my ass like, ah, like, like, ah, like a straw between ah, my crack. Hello, everyone. Hola, mis amigos. You're listening to Oh My God, Hi, Hijo de Dios. Hola. With me, George Lopez, porque sabes que, let's do the show, porque está acá la tira, tú tengas algo, algo, that dry cleaner ahí, by Kim Phelps, se pegó la cabeza ahí, algo que es, Neil Sporp, Spor and Paul. You know who George is? Oh, I'm sure he's around here somewhere. What's his name? George. George Lopez. George Lopez. Oh my God. OMG. OMG. Hi. Oh my God, hi. This is all very exciting, Gil. You know, we're six months in, and Amazon, you can listen to OMG High on Amazon, and we're going to be featured on a billboard in Times Square. So thank you, Amazon, and you can listen to Oh My God High on Amazon. Nothing but the best. I understand this could be on Alexa as well. Yeah, you can you can say, Alexa, play the podcast OMG High with George Lopez on Amazon. I'm going to do it when I get home. Alexa, play the OMG High podcast. Should be loud. Listen to that bullshit. <laughs> thank you, Amazon. All right, so she's the story previous to this is is, is perfect for where I'm going to go. Like somebody eating by themselves. I said, did you look sad? Okay? Because growing up, I'm an only child. My my grandparents were disconnected. I spent a lot of time by myself. And I still do. Like over this week, last weekend, I didn't leave the house once. I may have only sh- took a shower once, too. <laughs> Nasty. But... I'm much like I was, you know. It's, I've been going to the, been talking to the same guy, the therapist, for 20 years, and I think that and I, and I talk to him every every couple of weeks. So mentally, I would say mentally, when he and I talk, I do less bad things than I did 20 years ago, than 10 years ago. But now. I, we talk more about things about life and less things about what I have an issue with. But I know I have an issue with being reclusive or being in the house, but nothing's keeping me in the house. It's not because you're either people recognize, I don't get, it's been a long time. I'm not, I'm used to it, if, if that. But I just not, do not have the desire to go out. And I remember my therapist said to me, you know, what were you doing when you were 13? Thinking he had me, like, I got this motherfucker. <laughs> what were you doing when you were 13? I said, the same shit I'm doing now. I'm trying to learn how to play the guitar, watching TV, but now there's more to watch. So, you know, I don't feel alone. I don't feel lonely. But even with the dogs, like, I don't connect with the dogs, which is, which is why I started to adopt dogs in the first place, because the, the therapist said, hey, man, you got to get a dog, and you have to make that dog like love you, like be the master of the dog so that when you come home, he's happy to see you and then you're building a relationship with the dog. Well, I can't even do that. I I, I, I told you about the stray dog that came to my house. You can't and, even, so okay, so. And yeah. so that dog, he really is. I'm the, uh, I'm, I'm like the alpha. This dog comes up, he loves me, he cares for me and I truly care for the dog. You know, not like a, Almost like a human. I, I, yep. I've seen no, some no. people get carried away. I, I'm, I'm not that bad, but yet I'll take him to the vet. I'll spend money on whatever, whatever he needs. And that that damn dog comes over when I skin my knee. You notice I had yep. to say, he comes over, and it's like he knows I'm hurt. And he'll come over, and he'll start licking my knee, look, licking the wound. You know, he gets up every morning. I think they, yeah. And he comes, and he runs, and he jumps in the bed, and he just wants to get next to me. And my wife says, and, and I don't know why. <laughs> Your wife was like, listen, uh, the star has got to go. <laughs> no, she's the one that really wanted him when he got there. Yeah. Because she's not an animal. And she took like, she just says, I don't know why he does that. I'm the one that cooks. I'm the one that feeds That's him. Somebody. And I'm the one that takes him out for a walk <laughs> and think of shit. And yet yeah. he comes to you. Yeah. And she'll. Why is that though? Do you think you give him like a different kind of affection or anything like that? Like, is there a different? I'm the one that started with him when he first started coming up. Need that in my hand. Yeah, and he was straight too, right? Yeah, he was okay. straight, and we just bonded. 
she'll be out there in the front yard. I'll hear her. Milo! She'll be yelling for him. And then finally she'll say, Gil, I'll be in the house. Gil, call Milo. One time. Bam! And the dog comes running to the front door. He wants to come wow. back. Amazing. So he's, uh, he's all mine. And he's the same way with my son, too. Same way. Well, from rescuing dogs, I know that shit. I mean, I've seen some dogs that have been in bad shape. Like, beautiful dogs. There was a dog that I, like a little papillon, little black and white one, that was old. The name was, uh, um, what was his name? Kip, 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 Kipling? Kipling, I guess I got him. His okay. name was Kipling. So, poet's name. And, yeah. <laughs> and if I would hold him, he would literally, he would shit, he would shit, he would be, he, and he would stiffen up like, <laughs> like this. Like if they handed him to me, he'd stiffen up, he would shit. And you tell the rescue lady, like, why, why does he do that? He goes, oh, you know, some of these dogs are abused by men. Most, mm-hmm. of, most of the abusers of pets are men. And his recollection of men is that they beat him up or did whatever to him, and then they tighten up, and, he, and out of fear, they shit. Like I remember the, 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 the cri- I don't say, I want to say the right word. The Lisa, when Lisa was in here from the Big Love Rescue, Dog mm-hmm. Rescue, we did a show together, and she's and I said, so what do you do? Oh, you know, I work at Big Love Rescue, or it was Hope for Paws. She goes, you ever seen those videos of dogs? And I said, no. <laughs> it's like Sarah McLachlan singing yeah, a sad like, song. Worse. And she goes, you know, if you got time, you know, like go in the middle of the night or go on YouTube and just check them out. So there's videos of dogs that are waiting at an abandoned house for the owners to come back. And the owners have left, and they left the dog there. And nobody can go near the dog. Neighbors leave, like, food and water, but water in a half-cut milk jug and food, just throw them on the ground. And they abandon dogs everywhere. They find dogs under the cars. They find dogs in the garage, in the corner. And you call this place, and then they come and rescue a dog. And every single one of those dogs is it's fucking sadder. Every story is sadder than the next oh, one. Oh, I couldn't watch them. You could. Oh, yeah. No. You can't watch them. Turn no. to pieces. So I start watching them, and I start tearing up in the middle of the night. I'm like, man. But I end up, you know, I wake up once, maybe at 1.30, 2.30, fucking 7.30 in the morning, I'm still watching them. <laughs> and then you, you look at other the dogs being surrendered if, when they know they're being surrendered, and they, they stop and literally, like, just become part of the pavement, and you fucking have to go pick them up. And there was this lady that surrendered these two chihuahuas. She takes them to the shelter and puts them on the counter and strips them like fucking inmates at the county jail. Takes their fucking collar off, one collar, second collar, pulls the shirt off the other one, pulls the shirt off the other one, takes the leash off, hands them and fucking leaves with the clothes and with the collars and just leaves the dog there. I I took a dog to the uh, dog pound. And the shelter, now, you know, now, no, sh- shelter. You know, you know, there's a lot of things we're going to talk about today. Then, because <laughs> I've, 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 I've lined up five things that you and I don't know that everybody else knows. And I took oh, it to right. animal. Control. <laughs> I took it to Baldwin Park <laughs> Animal Control. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and this dog, I thought this was going to be my hero. I started calling him Storm. He was a husky. Uh, no, it wasn't a. Gotta it be fucking looked, hot. Those looked, looked like it looked like a husky. It was. Uh, not a Malamute. It was a white dog. Uh, oh, oh uh, Samoyed. Samoyed. That's what it was. It was a Samoyed. In East L.A. Nobody in yeah, East like L.A. In East LA. Nobody in East L.A. owns a Samoyed. No. And this dog's a stray. And I'm, I'm working patrol. I'm a cop car. And I come up and the dog wants to be by me. And I started sharing my food with him, giving him some tacos. And he was eating him. I opened the door. The dog jumped in. Wow, that's a big deal. And so I said, yeah. okay, come on. Let's go, boy. So I took him down to the station. I called animal control. I did the right thing. I said, here he is, pick them up, take him. As soon as he's available for adoption, call me. I want him. I'll take him. I don't want anything to happen to my dog. So took him. And, you, and by the way, sorry to interrupt you, that is the appropriate way that you do it. You don't see a lot of people that do it the appropriate way. You did it the 100% way they tell you. Find a dog. It's like when somebody used to find a wallet. Some people would return the wallet. These are the days that we lived in. Mm-hmm. You would find a wallet with money in it. You would return the wallet to the police department or wherever they said nobody claims it. 
is yours. Oh, yeah. Wild. Okay. Yeah. To think what we where we were as a, as a society yeah, I, back then. So, I go ahead, turn in the dog. Two weeks later, they call me up. He's ready. And the place was over on Garfield Avenue. And before I go in there, I buy me a great big, long, expensive leather training <laughs> leash. <laughs> nothing but the best of food. Everything. Ready this dog could be a champion dog. I take him home. The dog, my wife was so pissed off. First thing he got a hold of was I had a uh, down jacket. Oh, I had uh, feathers all over the goddamn backyard. Could shoot it up. Then, next thing I know, I had, uh, he bit a hole in my swimming pool line that goes to my pump, so burnt the motor on the pump. Wasn't getting water. It wasn't Whoa, getting water. Wow. It, it, so it has wow. expensive taste. It, it, it's, it's, it has expensive it's, it's killing taste. Me. He got into the trash. I had trash all over the goddamn, I had trash all over my place. And then my wife went to clean up the mess. She turned on the hose, and there's all kinds of fucking holes in the, you know, the <laughs> hose. God damn, wow. So she just said, okay, it's you or the dog. Wow. Not both of you. One of you's got to go. Wow. So I called up a society, a rescue for some... Samoid? Samoid. Samoid, yeah, Samoid, Samoid right? What kind of yeah. dog is it? Samoid, I think, right? S-A-M-O-Y-E-D. I bought, I bought one of those. So, I called, and they said, okay, here's the deal. Take it back to animal control. I promise you, we'll pick it back up within three, four days. We'll pick it up. We're not going to let that dog go. We have okay. society for him. It's good. This dog who wouldn't do shit for me now. Wow. I said, come on, boy. I put the leash. Oh, by the way, he chewed through the leather leash that I bought him, too. Mm-hmm. Damn. So I got oh, Was he a puppy? No. He was, he was. I think they're mad when they do that, right? I, I don't even know. I know I what know the puppies dog, they do, but I don't know what I don't that. know the no dog idea. psychology. Yeah. So <laughs> I went ahead. I opened my door on my pickup. Damn dog jumped right on in there. In. He's ready to go, and he's sitting there. He's a proud dog. I take him to animal control, and when I get there, I'm walking him in, Is he- and there's a little boy that's walking out with his mommy, and he's saying, he looks at me, he says, how could you? You're bringing that dog here so they could kill him. Whoa. And I'm saying, no, no. Yes, you are. Yeah, I know I what know goes on around here. And the boy is crying. She's like, come on. Come on, Johnny. Let's go. Whoa. The I dog said, that kid said that? Yeah. He, Because he knew that he thought I was taking the dog to put him, put him down. And he didn't. And he got picked up within three days because I called to check on him. They said, no, no, he was picked they up. Got, they got him? Yeah. The rescue got him. And nobody, wa- nobody wanted him. Well, the rescue wanted him, right? But they said they would take him because when I took him back, all I had to do tell animal control was he was a stray that I picked up, and you have it documented, and it didn't work out. Okay, so they take him back, no questions asked. But the Society for Smoid was there. They said we'll be there within three to four days. We'll pick him up. We'll take care of him. Nothing's going to happen to him. We'll make sure he has a, finds a good family home. You know, some. You know, first of all, they. From what I, from my studies, <laughs> they know some dog. I, I, you know, they would say you can't say all dogs, but some dogs know that they're in the pound, and or in the sh- they know and they know how bad it is. And when they get out, they know how lucky they are to get out, you know, and they behave like they are appreciative to have a home. They know. So very rarely do you see a dog like that. That was a stray, and I think, I'm pretty sure wherever he lived, if you go back, somebody probably cut him loose because he, he was, was just doing, a, He was just a travieso. He was a travieso, and he needed some discipline. He needed, you know, dogs. He probably was, I don't know if those are inside dogs. I guess they're, I all know. dogs are inside dogs now, yeah, but before. I, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I was an outside dog, and, and I know... I didn't get to spend enough time with them because I was working. I, right. I was out on patrol. Or... Indoor dogs, it says. Uh, I Googled it. I Indoor dogs. Oh, maybe that's why he did it, because I wouldn't let him inside. The wife wouldn't let him inside. Yeah, no, of course. But, pe- and but people then, Mexicans, didn't let their dogs inside the house. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. Nobody had a dog that was inside. Yeah. Like, I grew up every fucking and my grandparents dog. were the same way. They had a bunch of dogs. All, they lived on farms. It's a little different, but all outside, like five dogs. I have a good buddy named Ray. If he ever listens to this, he'll, he'll know who I'm talking yeah. about. Oh, Ray had a dog, and I said, what kind of dog food do you feed him? He said, it's a Mexican dog. He gets anything that's left over from here. That's it. If he doesn't like it, hit it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, exactly. The, uh, 
I had a I had a joke that the menudo on Tuesday you flip the bowl, the bowl <laughs> over the pot over and it fall out like Jello with meat in it, and the dog would run over there and just start eating it off the sidewalk with off, off the the concrete. Sure. And I would go in there to to give him a tortilla and he'd go. Ah, 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 I just try to kick you down a corn tortilla, but fuck you. <laughs> and uh, uh, he just he ate all of it, like a Jello with meat in it, fucking hominy and tripe. In the beginning, when my dog, this this last one that we had, that lives with us now, I weaned him on weenies. He loved weenies. Once we, okay, he's ours, no more weenies, now we get him dog food. Dog wouldn't eat the dog food. Yeah. I had to ask the vet, hey, you want me to give him these pills? Uh, how do I give them to him? Because this guy just See, put it in his food. I said, he doesn't eat dog food. I tried wet, I tried canned, I tried dry, I tried everything. He wouldn't eat it. All he ate was weenies when he was with me. <laughs> and they said, get your wife. Boil some chicken, no seasoning. So she boils chicken. She gets uh, veggies, you know, the frozen corn and her, yeah, not it, corn, listen. but carrots and uh, uh, peas, peas and carrots. Throws in with steamed, unseasoned white rice. Just mix it together, and the dog eats it like a champ. You know, maybe it was an Asian dog. I don't know. <laughs> it's a better meal than I eat. When, when I was married, I come downstairs. Anne's making hamburger meat with rice in it. And I'm like, oh shit. I go to the refrigerator, I pull out a couple flour tortillas, I warm them up on the thing, I get a spoon, put them in there, put some pico pica in there, roll them up with burritos, and she comes around the corner, she goes, what are you eating the dog food for? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean the dog food? She goes, I, I made that for the dog. The dog has stomach issues. I guess you give him hamburger and like white rice. And I was like, this is the shit that my grandmother would make. <laughs> and I thought, finally she's getting it. She's making the shit that I want to eat. <laughs> we, were in, we were some good friends. I was <laughs> some so good friends in, in Havasu. <laughs> And my buddy Ralph and myself, we had been drinking all goddamn day, and we, we were pisto. <laughs> and and we we're there visiting Linda and her husband John. I love that shit. Pisto is and, pisto and, is a good and, word for you to learn. And, oh, and so pisto. we're there, but only we had by the we're into the evening. Both Ralph and I were getting hungry, and she ain't offering up food. You know, <laughs> offer something up. You know, we're getting drunk, and then I see her over there, and she's got this mix, and she's mixing it all up. I said, <laughs> said Rob, look, she's going to make it. She got this little scooper like for melon balls. Uh, she's making balls. Uh, oh, she's making us some more dirt. Rob, look at this. We're going to score now. Mm. And John Lee says, no, don't get your, <laughs> don't get your mind set on food because that's for the dog. She's getting oh. ready to feed her dog. Oh, shit. I said, fuck it. How come Rob. she didn't want to feed you guys because she wanted you guys to leave? She, she, no, wanted you guys she, to leave. Was, she was drinking with us. Oh. She's, she's just a bad hostess. She was a bad yeah. hostess that night. You know, sometimes when they, I guess when they'd want you to leave, they, so, so, uh, I have a house in the desert in La Quinta, this guy burned that, uh, is almost like a, uh, when he lived on the lot at Warner Brothers. That's how we met him. He had enough money for an apartment, but he was a writer and he was like, do I want to be a, a writer or do I want to live in an apartment? So he rents an office in Warner Brothers two doors down from my dressing rooms. I had two rooms that connected, I had two rooms. And we see him and you would think he was a writer during the day, looked well put together. He was living in his office. No way. So he would, the guards go around, you know, they drive around, they check the doors and everything and he would hide from them and then make it appear like, I guess he would leave the lot and then he would either come, I don't know, maybe he wouldn't leave the line and come back in, sometimes he would, and he would make it look like he was leaving, hey, see you later, guys, and then I guess he would fucking come back on when they changed guards, around the block. <laughs> and he'd make it seem like he was just riding, you know, all night, and, but he was living there. So, he, he's gotten by in, in he's in, he's, he's gotten by like, just hand to mouth, you know, and he's in Titanic in the movie, like, toward the end, I mean, Oh, no He's way. in the water. Help us! <laughs> I mean, he he has a line in fucking Titanic, toward the end when before Leo Di DiCaprio floats away, he's just up in the water. Help us, please! Like, the fucking burn, man. Yeah. You know. So, I invite him to come and play golf in um, in in La Quinta with me, and I I rarely go there. So whatever's there stays there. Sometimes I tell him, hey, I'm coming. You know, just give me some milk. You know, cereals, all right, you know, different stuff. So I go in there, and he's sitting with his legs crossed like this, 
and he's got a cup of coffee. And this motherfucker is like MacGyver of, of things, you know. He could take that fucking fake green shit right there and make a fucking caldo out of that motherfucker. Just like crazy shit. So he's sitting there with his lace cross, big coffee cup. And I said, where did you get the milk? He goes, oh, uh, you had like ready whip in the refrigerator, whipped cream. So he, he shot the whipped cream in the coffee and it's, it's cream. Yeah. And then I go, where did you get the, uh, the biscuits? And he goes, oh, the biscotti, you, ha you had them up there. Like, he looked at the bag. They were left over from when I had this dog that I gave up. <laughs> <laughs> ah! They were fucking dog biscuits. <laughs> they were like peanut butter, long dog biscuits. He didn't read the package, or, or maybe he did. And he's sitting there, and he's dipping the fucking biscuit in the coffee, and he's eating the dog biscuits. Just like a like, like motherfucking, like, goddamn, Zsa Zsa Gabor, the fuck is sitting there, just fucking legs crossed with the coffee. Where'd you get the... Milk, oh, the whipped cream. Where'd you get those biscuits? They were up on the top. They even said Richard on it because that dog's name was Richard. <laughs> and he goes, oh, these dogs that Richard, these snacks that Richard bought, I guess, if he, was, if he was staying here. You know, I took, uh, I was at work. There was a female deputy. She saw one of the guys putting away what she thought was jerky. It was. It was jerky for dogs. And she said, I want some jerky. <laughs> And he said, no, 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 you don't want any of this. And so she said, no, no, I love jerky. Let me have it. He says, this one's old. She says, I don't care. Let me have it. She got it. She says, oh, you're right. This is old. She ate the whole thing. <laughs> so I went back. I had a dog at the time, and I told my wife, I said, this is what they did to Patty Rodriguez over there at the station. And my son heard me. My daughter came home, and he says, hey, you want some jerky? And he gave her some of the... And she started eating. Then she comes up to me. She says, Dad, she's ready to cry. JR gave me some <laughs> dog jerky. And I said, oh, son, now what am I supposed to do? Said, you know, oh, Dad, you can't let him get away with it. I said, okay. I said, start barking like a dog and tell her you're sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so so what's the difference? Like, so jerky is, I mean, jerky is beef? made from dried out beef, right? Yeah. 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 So what would the difference be in jerky... What's the difference between a Slim Jim, which I love, by the way, you're so not supposed I. to eat them. Yeah. Oily, who knows what the fuck is in that that makes it go perfectly round. Listen, yeah. for meat to go perfectly round <laughs> in whatever fucking skin that is. It's an abomination. But what? But I don't eat them all the time. But you know, there was a, I never told this story. There was a, there was a hired patrolman. I used to work at a, I used to work at a liquor store in high school in Canyon Country. Uh, and there was a police officer that would go in there, and he was a fucking asshole. And they used to have these tubes of jerky in the front mm -hmm. of the thing, and long like that. I'd put them in my culo and walk around ah, for ah, like five ah, minutes, ah, and then I would put them back in the tube. But I put them in my ass, like in, like, like like a straw between my crack. And you know, this was in high school, so that, that it wasn't a, you know. It fit perfectly, <laughs> and I would walk around for like five minutes and make a couple sandwiches with the with the thing sticking out like a little periscope, you know. You know when somebody puts a face on a pencil, and you look at it, everybody, everybody's going like this. The pencil has a face. I put that thing in my you with that pencil with, 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 with a little pencil, like a little face coming out, and then I with the guy would I go, hey, it's ready, and the guy I was working with would pull it out and put it back in the in oh, the fucking thing. Fuck, One of his liability in my, right now. Did you ever, did you ever see like, yeah, the fuck cop yeah. tape one? <laughs> he'd go in there and he'd go, how's it going? You fucking criminals. He'd undo the thing and he'd fucking pull one out, and you would go like. <laughs> and and we would say, all right, nobody eat out of this one right here. Like when somebody was looking at him, pull him back. If you remember, put him back out there. That guy would come in there. You fucking, ah, what are you guys do? He's robbing it. He's stealing anything today. Just fucking, you're like, fuck this guy. So we put him in there, and then we play jerky roulette. But I think all of them at some point had culo in it. <laughs> See, well, thankfully, Gil, you said the, sta the statute of limitations is passed on that. You think? Yeah. 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 It was not as bad as the guy that put cyanide in the Tylenol. But oh yeah, for well, for awesome. for for those times to put to put a long jerky stick in your culo <laughs> and and continue your, the services as an I, employee. I, I'm just wondering now, what was your motivation? <laughs> Stick something up your food. Yeah, I know. Like that, are you kidding me? That's hilarious. There's, a lot of that in there. there's been a lot. There hasn't been a lot of things. That, you know, like they used to say, the old Chicago. That's like, that's an exit, not an entrance. <laughs> the uh, but in in that stuff. And so whatever is in the slim gym. Like if I go to a golf tournament, and sometimes they have like on one of the holes, they have like a little convenience store set up. I think at Cedric's golf tournament, they have like like a Seven Eleven on the thing, and you go over there, and everything's free. 
and uh, I'll take 10 fucking Slim Jims or those things and put them in the bag. And once a year, maybe, once a year, I would eat all 10 like at the same time. But net, it's rare because you can eat them all the time now, but you don't. But once in a while, I think when the moon is in the right oh, yeah. frame, <laughs> you sit in there and you watch TV and eat these things. As a nasty. father, you know, with my daughters and Girl Scouts, my son played t-ball and then one year of football they used to sell cookies and candies right. and all this shit the best seller was they would sell those beef sticks no the, shit. the football team got them and they were easy sell easy take them to the station put them up to everybody wanted to take them out they were all culo free too <laughs> <laughs> you never got they started to wrap they store. started to wrap them <laughs> i'll only eat one now if it's wrapped but but wait these weren't wrapped oh you're talking about the ones you had were they not weren't wrapped. wrapped oh yeah oh. In the old days oh i didn't even think they came that. in a tube oh. they came in a tube you could just pull them out of there well that gives the story a whole new flavor oh <laughs> <laughs> so you know back then it's ex ex exactly so in little league my grandmother worked at rca over there on uh Roscoe and Balboa, I ended up working with her, which became the thing for my show that we worked together. Because, you know, when we started to put the, sh the show idea together, they would say, well, what, what are the things that you guys did together? And I said, oh, shit, you know, when I was like 20, we worked together. Perfect. Make a place where we, her and I worked together. Yeah. Perfect. P perfect. It, just, it didn't look staged. It didn't look unreal. We worked at the same place. And I became like the boss, and she was the worker, and then you had the conflict. And... Um, they would in in little league they would sell um there was those chipmunks that used to that used to sell the the, the what would they call it? like butter toffee peanuts oh yeah yeah but they were like the chip the two the fucking chipmunks or whatever chippendale like the but but it had a chipmunk on the package or whatever oh. anyways for little league you would sell butter toffee peanuts and to this day I have some in the house. I looked at them a couple of nights ago. I was going to eat them, but they look—they all stick together. They, they look a little bit gotcha. I buy them at the fair, right? Yeah. Right. So, I was—I can, can't. I used to go door to door. I fucking hated it. I mean, I'm, I'm not a door to door. Listen, I could fucking even talk to my friends. I'm not going right. to go fucking door to door. You stayed at home all weekend. You're not, not going to want to go door to door. Go to, if a house was on fire. I would just sit in there and burn up. Why don't you call your neighbors? I don't talk to those fucking people. <laughs> just fucking sit and burn. I'd rather burn up than knock on my neighbor's door. Hey, could you call 911? I'd rather, I'd rather die. So I don't know what the psychology, I don't know. That's good fodder for your next session. I, I guess <laughs> fucking, yeah, I don't know why. The, but he, I think he knows. So my grandmother would take it to work and come back and go, here, and throw it at me. The two pages were filled out of, like, of shit that was, she had sold... 250 fucking boxes at work, which is perfect. But really, you want to teach me a lesson, you would say, I'm not going to do that for you. You're going to have to do something for yourself. You're going to have to go door to door and sell them. What if I don't? Then you're not. So cut to, funny how things connect. The In San Fernando High, the coach Martin had passed away. He's passed away a few years ago. And then that was the one where he gave us $250 worth of car wash tickets to pay for the batting cage and the stuff that the players had to pay for. But he didn't tell us that if you sold no tickets, you were still liable for $250. Like you owed him $250. Didn't tell us that. Of course, why would he tell us? But I didn't sell any. I didn't even try to sell them. Then when I go there, he goes, you owe me $250. I'm like, for what? For these tickets. And I said, I didn't sell any tickets. Yeah, but you're going to use the equipment. You're not going to sell any of these tickets. What do you think the equipment, do you think it's free? I said, hey, man, fuck you and fuck your equipment. I didn't, I'm not giving you shit. Then he went in on me telling me I'm a quitter and how shit gets tough. I fucking pack it in. I'm a fucking, he likes to see me in 10 years, see where I'm at because, you know, quitters don't get shit. Let's see where you are in 10 years. I'm like, oh, yeah, motherfucker. And we're, I may, I'm probably not even 18. And we're this far away from each other in, in the gym. I can still remember standing, had two dudes behind me and he had the assistant coach behind him. And we're like this. <clears throat> and then we leave, and the, my two friends were like, fuck, I, they were tripping, man. I've never seen a student and a teacher go at it like that. Like, yeah. back, fuck you, fucking quit, motherfucker. And then I start playing golf, and golf is, is tough to learn how to play. Tough. Hit the ball sideways, didn't know what I was doing, didn't pay, have money to pay for lessons, and I would quit every time it got hard. So play, sometimes I play nine holes and quit. Those guys are like, where are you going? Ah, man, you know, I got to go do something. Short story, one day I'm leaving, and it's like when someone says, I could hear a voice, 
So I'm driving, and I hear this voice say, every time it gets tough, you pack it in. And I'm like, what the fucking... Still remember where I was in the hover by the 210, get on the 210, you pack it in. I'm like, this I said, what the fuck? Start to think about it, start to go through my life, and this guy was right. I had already started doing stand-up, probably doing stand-up for like five years, but I quit. Come back, quit, come back. So I fucking, one day I go over to the school, and I, and I wait till all the students leave, and all the baseball players go to their locker room. He's picking up the bases, and I'm walking towards him, and he's looking, and he's like, is that my third baseman? I say, hey, coach, what's up? And he's like, what, what are you doing? What, what's going on? I say, hey, man, I just, I came to tell you that I'm sorry, you know, for the way that I behaved when I was here. What, what, what are you talking about? Man, I remember that day that you and I, uh, this and that, called me a quitter. Well, you know what, man? I, you know, I apologize to you because I, I realized that you were right. And I said, and I couldn't go on with my life unless I came and told you that I was sorry. And I don't think that, you know, Chicanos, we'd rather pretend that somebody's dead, then say sorry, then admit. My grandmother had a sister that she didn't talk to forever. They even looked alike. And one time we saw them at the, put it on my show in the first four episodes, that she saw this woman at the end of the aisle and she goes, this way, this way, this way. I'm like, what the fuck, what the fuck's going on? This way, this way, this way. And I go back and I look, and I the fucking, I said, that lady looks like you. That's my sister, Charlotte. I said, I didn't know you have a sister. I don't have a sister. And I'm like, wow. Ooh. <laughs> it looked like a younger version of my grandmother. Fucking didn't even know she had a sit. That's that's my what is it? My aunt? It's my aunt. Yeah. And two sentences apart. That's my sister Charlotte. I didn't know you had a sister. I don't. I don't. So when I went and told him that, he said, "Hey, did you? That's why you. That's why you came down here to tell me that." And I said, "Yeah." And he puts his hand out, shakes my hand. He goes, "There might be hope for you yet." And. Once I went back to doing stand-up, I had learned the quitter, April 23rd, 1984, my birthday, and I had been already away. The guys would see me, and I, was, I wasn't bad. It wasn't entirely bad. It wasn't great. Still starting. And I went back, and I said, no matter what happens, I'm not going to quit. And all this happened from April 23rd, 1984, whatever all this is, for the good and the bad of whatever. But I don't think that was a lesson I would have learned without that interaction, which was awful, I felt bad because I was always respectful of people. And without playing golf, I just wouldn't have had I wouldn't have had anything happen to me in my life that was challenging where I would where I would quit. You know, if I was mad at a friend, I wouldn't talk to that person. If I was with some girl didn't work out, wouldn't talk to him like one and one and done. So up. Uh, you know, still doesn't get me out of the house. I hear you're a pretty good golfer too. <laughs> not bad. No, I'm not, and I love it. And then, you know, I used to get mad and throw shit, but what it did was it gave me a temperament that I needed for business and I needed for standup that I wouldn't have learned any other way. Mm -hmm. Guys that throw clubs or get mad or or never get it together after, I would I would find a way to slow down, play back to the middle or whatever, and it's fun. But I don't really keep score. I'm more into the into the temperament. Very rarely, I still on occasion get mad, but I'm more about the good feeling of it because there's a feeling that goes to the club and when you hit it and you see where it's going, where it's supposed to be going, that is almost, I guess, would be like if somebody rubbed your head or tussled your mm -hmm. hair, or, you know, the, that you feel it in your, in your yeah. chest. So my grandfather wasn't that person. My grandmother wasn't that person. And golf, even when I was married, like, you know, uh, and talking to Ann again, you know, like 10 years after, they'll text me and I don't text her back. It's like, I just... I don't, I don't know if you can be, I don't if I want to be friends with, it's not that I don't appreciate it, but I just have a hard time, almost like, I don't, shouldn't say, but going back because it's just, you know. Well, I, you answer I've, my text, I'm happy. I know, I've done it. Like, I just don't, don't think that, you know. Yeah, no. I mean, that's a powerful story, dude. Like, it, going back, like, because you were, what, 20, 24, 25, you said, yeah. when you went back and apologized? Like, not a lot of 24 or 25-year-olds would have done that. I think it sort of speaks to what's happened to you since then, that you did do that. And it's always funny, those kind of, like, <coughs> time bomb truths or whatever yeah, that, that we have, where it's, I don't, I don't know, I just... I don't know, I got to go back and thank Dr. Robert Morneau, the guy that gave me the intelligence or the, the ability to see, in the Night Stalker case, the stuff that I was seeing that was making him a sexual deviant that I could recognize. And what did that doctor do? Wait a minute. So I, I took two semesters at Cal State from this guy. He was a professor, uh, Dr. Robert Morneau, retired FBI agent. 
and I took two semesters. He required more work than any professor wow. I've ever had of advanced criminal investigation pertaining to sex crimes. And so he's the one that taught me about understanding and the ability to listen and to recognize things that because somebody wants to see the fear in somebody's eyes, that's a sign of sexual deviancy. Wow. You know, the, the way they do things. The, the guy, if I give you uh, a condo in Mammoth, it's snowing outside, you have a flickering fireplace, no cell phones, no outside detractors, no kids, no bill collectors, nobody contact me, just you and that special member of society that you want to be with. Music, you're both out of the shower, white bearskin rug or d'oeuvres and wine or beer on it. It sounds like that's going to turn into a night of raw adulterated sexual intercourse. That's because that's sex to you. But now I got a guy that can't afford to go to Mammoth and he doesn't have another member of society. He's up in the hills of Malibu and he's got his own member in his own hand. And he's got a book of matches. He just set the hills of Malibu on fire and now he's in an act of masturbation because he's a pyromaniac and that's sex to him. So I learned all this stuff Damn. from Bob Morneau. And it was all good. So after the case was, during the case, I had permission from the department to go get him and bring him on board to help us out. He was on sabbatical in Greece. After the case was all over with, everything said and done, he was back. I got to go back and thank him for giving me the knowledge to work the case. He's the one that made it. Uh, Give me another example of, of deviancy. I think that's a, I mean, that's a pretty, pretty good one, man. Yeah. Like, you know, people that light fires but i think they but but also let's say since my knowledge of uh, serial killers is that if one thing they do have in common is abusing animals jeffrey dahmer would kill a dog and put the head on a stick or leave the head on the fence so everybody could see it but a, a, a disrespect of animals or hurting other kids or i think primarily animals though you because you can tell a lot about a person he looked, he, he said, uh, he asked, how many people, how many guys in this class, men and women, most of them were cops uh, of the Cal State LA. Just, so he says, how many people have been in here, went to a burglary call where somebody's burglarized the house, you're just gonna take a report and you see somebody is defecated in some place other than the toilet, either in a bedroom or in the living room, just a big old honking uh, piece of mierda right there. Load right there. And, and, and he says, you know, and I raised my hand because I had seen that before. And he says, okay, he says, if you're looking for the high burglar, you're barking up the wrong tree. You find the local sexual deviant. He went in there to take a shit. While he's done, now incidental to being here, now I'll steal. But it was the fact that he wanted to go take a dump. Richard himself told us uh, up in the Sierra Madre case, he asked me, he says, hey, did you see where I took a dump? I said, you didn't take a dump at that place. He says, yeah, I did. I said, the only place there was a dump, he stopped me, he says, by the bushes. And I said, yeah, he says, that was me. <laughs> wow. You know, so he was a sexual deviant. Nobody knows around. that. That wasn't I, in the thing. I, I, no. I sure didn't so he that. said to you, because you were on him. You yeah, were on well, him. We were, now we're just talking. Now you're just talking. He yeah. said, did you see where I took a dump? Yeah. And, and he goes, you didn't take a dump in there. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, not yeah, in the did. house, outside. Yeah, I did. He said, I said, there was nobody in there. He said, by the bushes. And I said, yeah, and there was. By the bushes, right outside the front, right out the bedroom window, there was a big shit, big turd there. I just thought it was a dog. And why would somebody do that? Sign of sexual deviancy, you know. I, I've interviewed prostitutes, you know, and working a hooker murder. We're, we're, we're looking for a John that used to get a little rough, you know, maybe because it was a hooker that died. And so we're talking to this hooker, and she's sitting there, you got anybody to get from it? He says, no, anybody treat you bad? He says, well, Frenchie, Frenchie gets a little pissed off when I can't perform. I says, what do you mean? He says, well, he likes to come over and have, he just wants me to dump on him. Well, I'm thinking dump on him, you know, maybe tell stories, you know, give me sad stories, <laughs> right, dump yeah. all my sorrows on him. And so my partner looks at her, he says, what do you mean dump? She says, yeah, he liked me to dump on him, you know, shit right here. He liked her to shit on his chest. And then she ends up her story by saying, but he really wasn't a bad guy. He had this patch right here in his arm, something unified school district. The guy worked for the schools. Whoa. And he wore the patch to yeah. the hooker? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he was a janitor, a bus driver, something uh, for the school. What's the psychology of that? I don't know. They ask a doctor why, you know, because 
it, it, it's a deviancy, right? It, it's a deviancy. What is, it? is that? Uh, uh, another deviancy, uh, necrophilia, where people like to yeah, have sexual intercourse with dead bodies. You know, and, and Morneau just says, for purposes of this class, sex is whatever makes you feel good. That was okay. his definition for sex. Whatever makes you feel good, because what turns you, you on may not turn somebody else on. So, but also it has to trace back to childhood. No, I don't trace, I don't know where it stems you, from, how they get it, how they get their information, how they gather it, I don't know. I mean, it's too, it's too easy to say it goes back to childhood, but, but there is, I think, some characteristics of a certain type of behavior. I think in, in, in serial killers that they were yeah. abusive. Abused, Richard was abused, a lot of them have been, been abused. Uh, what was the... What was it, one of the guys, that, I think even one of them, I think the, wasn't the Golden State guy, wasn't he a police officer? Or Yes. He was Golden a State killer officer. was a police officer for a while. Yeah. I I don't know, man. That's. I believe, and that, now, now don't quote me on this. Last week, I believe, I told Grant, I, I was here early and I was studying because I know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I noticed you like the serial killer, I needed the crime, the drama. So I was studying, I was surprised you didn't bring it up, but I wanted to be prepared for you. So I was studying on Rodney Alcala. That's right. Because he passed away. He passed away at age 77. So The looking dating up game killer. The dating game killer. And looking, reading about him, I believe he was abused as a child as well. He was abused as a child, um, but, but, all, uh, but also he wasn't unattractive. No. Okay, so what Ted Bundy... Was not you know, unattractive. Was yeah. not unattractive. Did he win Richard, when he was on the dating game? He did. Yes. Oh, wow. Uh, but the girl backed out. She, she, wanted, she didn't want to go out with him. She thought he was a freak. Because she got fucking creeped out mm-hmm. by him. Yeah. So he would pretend he was a photographer. Yeah. Yes. He was in good shape, had long hair, not a bad looking dude. And he would go to Huntington Beach. He would go to different areas where women were. And he would ask if he could take pictures with of them. And he said that he was... A, tr- a photographer for a certain kind of magazine that he could have been back then. Yeah. He could have been. And those girls would say, yeah, sure. And then take him in his car and then, you know, take him back to the place. And he had a bunch of pictures in there. Yeah. This was like 70s, 80s? Is that yeah. when he was active? Some people said, uh, Sobe Dickman testified that Richard Ramirez was quite a handsome young man. When he pulled his hair back and he wore a suit, it looked like he was a Miami dope dealer. You know, he was right. ready to go out Saturday night. Thin, high cheekbones. Th- some people thought he was very good looking. They did. And you could see where, like, if a guy is uh, charismatic, where you don't get put off initially by someone being creepy. So if a guy is charismatic, like Rodney Acala had a good, had a good rap, and, and you look at Richard Ramirez, you wouldn't necessarily be put off initially. So that's his kind of defense. Where yeah. if I can get close enough, Ted Bundy, yeah. or pretending your car doesn't work, or like in Silence of the Lamb, you know, can you help me put this uh, couch into? He's, he's, more he's, coral. he's got a broken arm, <laughs> which I think that guy should have won an Academy Award for. His oh, that was great. Oh. Buffalo Bill, right? I forget. The he should have won a should have won an Academy Award. It's the lotion in the basket. Ted Levine. Ted Levine, Levine, Aaron from downtown. And he does, and he does, uh, he was on some show he, on. He was in the movie Heat, too. TBS, and, yeah. But I mean, yeah. for that performance, didn't get an Academy Award. Right. I don't know who beat him that year, but. It, I don't know. So, um, I was watching Woodstock 99 on on HBO. Have you seen it? Uh, no, but I've had friends uh, recommend. Is it new? Just came it's, out? I think it's brand new. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've seen it maybe five times oh, already. Okay. Because of the psychology of... So this is 99 before cell phones. Mm-hmm. And they even say like Woodstock 69 was more of a aberration of like, it, it, it. you know, they didn't make any money. They had this concert... In New York, Woodstock, New York, color Woodstock. They had all these things. The fence came down. People were swimming in water. There wasn't any porta potties. I don't think they were swimming in the lake, doing whatever. And it just drugs and hanging out and tough circumstances and backed up traffic and trying to sell sandwiches and, and all those things. But somehow it became an iconic 
three days. Yeah, lightning in a bottle. To lightning in a bottle. Yeah. And then Woodstock 99, same guys try to do it. They're older now, before cell phones, and they book all of these acts. And, I mean, there's a lot of people there. There, there might be 500,000 people there. Wow. And the, I remember the girl said, so there's a lot of, lot of white Guys, 22, 25, with backward hats and all that angst at drinking. They had some security peace patrol guys, like in yellow shirts. I say peace patrol, and they were supposed to, ones that go around. Those guys are so fucking hot. Wouldn't let you, trying to sell water for $4 a bottle. Mm -hmm. Beer and water were the same price. And then those guys were like, fuck this, man. And then it was on an old Air Force base and the fucking heat from the sidewalk, it's brutal. And they already have issues, it's six hours, they're six hours into the first day, and they're already having issues. And Moby, the guy Moby, the DJ, the, the artist, BTL Moby, guy, yeah. he says something that I wanted to ask you about. He said, you know, and it's, and it's true, he goes, he goes, from years of being in clubs and years of performing, he goes, we got there and I got off of the bus or his ride and he got out and he says there's something in here that just fucking doesn't feel right and they and he said well what was that he goes you know just years of performing like mm -hmm. i can tell already if i get there what it's going to be like and so can i i can tell from 42 years of at least 30 of them for solid working i can tell in the room if there's gonna be a problem or it's gonna be good, I can tell if there's gonna be an issue with somebody. And sometimes I call people in, I said, hey man, there's some guy out there that's talking, can you have somebody that can't find him? Just, well, I can hear him. Just yeah. fucking go out there to find him. Sometimes they remove people, but I tell them before, even when I let a guy go before me, you can hear somebody yelling out, call the guy, I said, hey man, there's a dude out there that's talking, we're trying to find him. Well, motherfucker, find what do you mean you're trying to find him? I can hear him from in here, how can you not find him? You could kind of hear it, and he says, there's something in there not right. So what happens is they start to paw at women. You know, it's all confined in the mosh pit in the front. They put girls up. Now they're starting to rip girls' tops off oh, and sexually assaulting girls and just this Lord of the Flies mentality. And they're in there and ripping tops off. And girls are doing it. In the beginning, they're doing it on their own. And then they're showing, the, you know, the chest and they cover it. And the radio station there has the radio station banner and two girls and the DJs up there and they're showing their tits and it's like, show your tits. And it becomes that for like a day, two days. And even Rosie Perez walks out there in a dress and they're like, show your tits, show oh, your, the whole crowd is chanting. She's like, I'm not gonna show my tits. They fucking boo her. And they're like, you can just, it's just fucking this mob. Yeah. And you can see and then you see interactions of people and they go, I don't know who put this fucking lineup together, but you have like Jewel and you have uh, 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 Moby, Alanis Morissette, and then you have Alanis Morissette, uh, Limp Biscuit, <laughs> fucking Rage Against the Machine, Metallica. Those are the last four acts Jeez. of, of s Saturday. So Alanis Morissette goes up there and she's singing like, isn't it ironic? And fucking they're not into it and you can see it the fucking mm. guys are like they're fucking just like shut the fuck up yeah. they're just fucking just and you can see it in her face you can see it in her face and and i know the look on somebody's face when they're like fucking get me the fuck out of here and she's got to play she doesn't get paid she can't wa walk off and sometimes you do walk off i've walked off and said fuck it there's nothing you can do at some point you're lost yeah you know and you can see it on her face and she's kind of looking down and she's singing but half-assed singing and then she's done she goes i love you guys so much you could tell being fucking <laughs> <Completely> just fake <laughs> fake puts a microphone down she's out and then other people are talking and they show jewel was like the next day and she says immediately when i get out there i'm like what can i play that these motherfuckers won't like just turn on me and you can see her standing up in front of the mic and they show her face. And I don't think I've ever seen a performer with that look on their face like, what the fuck am I doing here? And what do I gotta do to get the fuck out of here? Like just this look of like panic. She's an incredible performer, but you just see what you don't see it 
just this look like you see her talking to her guitar player like what the fuck are we going to do and she's done and then Limbiscuit goes out there and the bass player walks out and he's like this from the beginning Jeez. so they're like he set the tone by going like that mm -hmm. and then it just went got got worse and worse and then they went to him and said like hey try to you know, calm everybody down. And he's like, fuck that. He didn't do it. And they were, and he said, if you're trying to blame Fred Durst, Limbiscuit, he did what fucking Limbiscuit does. Like, if you pay somebody to perform, he was doing what he was performing. Yeah. So then Red Hot Chili Peppers are one night, I think the last night. And during the day, you know, that that shooting in Columbine that year, and this, this these two dudes are selling, like, you're giving away candles. Like little little candles like this, uh -huh. and you can sign a petition against shooting in schools and make schools safer, which which makes sense. And they got this African American dude, the whitest sounding dude ever, and he's like, "Just join us tomorrow, take this candle, and you'll, tomorrow at eight o'clock we're gonna have a, a, a vigil." So then the cut to the next person, they go, "I don't know who had the fucking idea <laughs> to give out fucking <laughs> candles <laughs> because what did they do? They lit everything on fire." So, damn. They start fucking tearing down the fucking monitors. There's three monitors. They start tearing the shit down. They built a, a peace wall <laughs> that, that, that kids painted that week. And the wall goes, you know, it's pretty long distance. They fucking start kicking down the wall oh and God. tearing it down. Now they take the plywood and they have dudes surfing on it while well, Limbiscuit's up there people are holding the plywood and dudes are dancing on the plywood and they fall through the plywood it breaks now they're sexually assaulting women and pulling them over and pawing at them and some nasty shit that's going on in there no, but, but again at a time where no cell phones I don't think you could do I'd like to think that that wouldn't happen now because you'd be held responsible for your behavior yeah. if they try to identify it like in the cat like in the capital uh, yeah. thing. but but mm -hmm. now they're lighting shit on fire and now the red hot chili peppers are out there and you see three fucking huge fires with embers going in the air you see the guy walk over he's talking to anthony kiedis the lead singer and he's like hey uh you know try to get these people and what do they do? They play Fire by Jimmy Hendrix. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's pretty rock and roll, though. And they're out. And then they leave. But it, it's, it's fucking mayhem. Oh, and, you know, they even say, like, you know, just because Woodstock was lightning in a bottle, and they did it in 94, and the, temper, the temperament was different in people, that 99, they were out of their fucking minds. And I'm, I'm not sure if it's ever gotten back to being out of it, but, but they just did Lollapalooza. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, it, Cause, and I saw similar headlines where I was like, Miley Cyrus fans were freaking out because, like, you know, Playboy Cardi or something was right before, and they're like, "I'm not ready for this crowd." And the Playboy Cardi crowd was like, "I don't want to be here for Miley fucking Cyrus," and no riots as far as I know, but at least some but of at that least, dynamic, yeah. Because DMX, God rest his soul, had a song that you know has the N word in it, and even the people that that, that, talk, that talk to this reporter, African American guy, and he's like. You know, I was, everybody was wondering if he was going to do that song. And he did it. And it's a call and response. Like, you say it, they say it back. He does the words, they say it back. And then the African reporter is there talking, and he's like, you give license to everybody to say that word. He goes, even if you had friends that you didn't know were N-word sayers, he says. Like, yeah, N-word sayers. They're all doing it. And I mean... If there's 250,000 people there, they were all doing it. He goes, so what if you're an African-American person in the crowd and you hear this? How do they treat you when you walk by? I mean, all of it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just once you've, like, activated that mode. But in that, in that call and response, they were – that guy, may have, DMX might have had the best set of anybody because he went early. I think James Brown started it Friday <laughs> at, like, 1230. James Brown. Brother James. Got Brother James soul. did yeah. it. They probably got down to James Brown, man, to show respect to James Brown. But it, it just deteriorated to the point where, you know, you, you can't imagine the liability. Somebody died. 
this dude that was there talking about his friend. They got separated. His friend died. They were treating him for a heart attack. He was ODing. They, like, uh, paddled him when he was ODing. They oh, don't wow. paddle a person that's ODing. He thought he was having a heart attack or some shit. Dead. And he's like, how do you, how do you go with a, to a concert with a dude and then you have to call his parents and say, hey, man, you know. You, you wait like, until the movie comes out. Then you tell parents, hey, hey watch the, the movie. Hey, yeah. go watch this movie. So like 23 years later. So in 79, there was a, there was a festival uh, for two days at the Coliseum called the World Music Festival. And uh, fucking almost everybody was there. Van Halen, Aerosmith, the UFO, Black Sabbath, Molly Hatchet, Blackfoot, uh, Boomtown Rats, uh, Scorpions, every fucking you, everybody, everybody's there. We saw one w- woman, like high, naked. Nobody touched her. Nobody tripped out. Nobody tried to grab her. Nobody, you know, you just look at her. She's tripping, whatever, whatever she's tripping on. And it's crazy to think that I was at a festival in '79, fucking old man. And then you see the one in '99, and they're fucking just. They even said like. This woman, this girl said that they had three dudes had her by one leg, three up by another one, and they she heard somebody say, "Rip her apart." Oh, oh Jesus! Geez. I mean, what the fuck? But it's all it's crazy. Whatever society, like they're like, what, what are what are in these people that they don't think that society is for them? Listen, I mean, they, the fucking society is is bad, but it ain't bad for a 22, 25 year old fucking white dude. It ain't that bad? It's worse for people that are without a home that lose their. Yeah. Fucking light, you know. I just think they get wound up with everybody else. They're wound yeah. up, yeah. and they're drinking, and there's no, not drinking. If drinking aggravates, then the conditions are bad. They're, you know. You see one guy jump on top of a cop car in a riot, then pretty soon you'll see ten people up on that right. cop car. They just get wound up in the frenzy, and then they go. Yeah, yeah. I, I could be talking out of my ass here, but I'm pretty sure I've read that, like in big crowd events like that too. It's like they've done research, and like the part, like the part of your brain that holds like the ego or whatnot, like. It's it deactivates a bit, and you just go with the flow. Like you're barely even thinking to some degree. You're part of this crowd. There's a guy in there, skinny dude, and he's like, "Hey, I'm not anything like that, and I did it." He's like, "I was surprised at myself." But fucking mild mannered dude, he goes, "I did it," and they're just. And at the end, now they go to the concessions and they take over the concessions and they steal everything that's there. They tear down the fucking booths. They tear down all the T-shirts. They open up a truck that has frozen fucking pretzels in there. They start throwing frozen pretzels at everybody. And at the end, you just see all these burnt out frozen pretzels on the ground. And it just, they said it just became like the symbol of, man, fuck this $4 water bullshit. And they, the, the, pot, the porta potties were overflowing. Boom. And people are mudsliding in the water. It's shit water. And they're in there. Man, what the? No. All in a... All in a festival. All in that. You have to watch it. Let me know what you think. I'll watch. Oh, Although by your face, that. I think yeah. you're going to. But, but yeah. until you see it, because I, I'm interested in that. Dude, I'm not a psychologist, but I'm interested in the psychology of why people behave the way they do. Maybe maybe because of myself. Maybe because of the way I act. I'll try to fucking my, diagnose myself. So, you know, when I had my eye thing, which is better now, uh, the dude came and did it at my house, the optometry at your house. They, they do great. Uh, uh, I love the way this doctor worked too. Went up on me, came fast, held this bone down, puts it, he goes, I'm gonna numb your eye, your eye, your eye. This motherfucker comes with a needle. We do it on the balcony because the light's better, should have done the balcony the first time. <laughs> and then he leans up against this cheekbone and he's like, I'm pressing against your bone, and then he shoots it, and then it numbs my eye. Then he takes a lid clip and turns it up under and cuts into it. You feel anything? Can't you can you feel him fucking with your eye, but then he cuts it and drains it, and you're just like, all right, cuts the thing, puts it down, put this on your eye, goes away, you know, better and immediately better. And then the other doctor that was there started to say, he goes, hey, um, you you ever uh, you ever you go out? I said, no, I don't really, I don't really go out much, you know. He goes, well, you know, do you go to restaurants? Said, eh, no, not not a lot. You stay in a lot, yeah. He goes, uh, you know, I guess he was starting to talk about like Lexapro, like, um, you know, for depression. Is yeah, for depression. Yeah, it's a very common antidepressant. Yeah. So I've never taken an antidepressant before in my life. And uh, and then he starts telling, I never even thought about it. And then I, I, I go, uh, 
Huh? He goes, well, you know, I said, you know, can you prescribe it? You, you want to try it? I said, no. I said, I don't know, man. I don't know what, you know, I'm fucking Ch Chicano. I don't know what depression feels like. I mean, <laughs> feel like it just, I think it's kind of inherent in, in all of us that you almost don't want to go out or. You know, I don't know. I love going out. I love people. There you go. There you go. Counter so, counterpoint. There you go. Counterpoint. <laughs> so I've been taking it for, has it been a week? Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been on Lexapro before. I know a number of people have been on Lexapro. I, I think it takes, for, for me, I felt it right away. For a lot of people, it takes, I think, even weeks to like you know what up I, to like an effective I felt it right away. Though. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you, yeah, tell I don't us about it. Have you been enjoying I don't think it? I, mean, I think I feel better, but I don't go out. I was supposed to golf later on today, which if I do, which I have to, I've invited these guys, it would be something that I would not necessarily would have done like at 5, 4.30 or 5, because I would have talked myself out of it. So I think if I if this can help me from talking myself out of going out, that's that would be a, a big hurdle because I'd be like, uh, I would be like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just about a two beer show. I'm going to go out and then you talk yourself out of it. Which you you never done that, but I, did you do that? Oh, all the time to the, to this day. And I mean, there's there's a world too. I'm constantly trying to untangle what's like you know, what is some like weird sort of like maladaptive behavior or something like I want to get rid of, and what's like just kind of my preferences. Because I'm I'm like you, I'm a homebody, but a part of me is like, should I want to go out? So I know exactly. There's there's a world where Lex Pro just makes you way happier to hang out at home all the time. I got but that's uh, better. That's a what message from uh, Pagan posted something on uh, Instagram. Nice little thing about uh, the show that we had here and meeting. Uh, Who did that? Pagan, your friend. Oh, Angelo. Angelo. And uh, he said, you got to get out and have breakfast. At and, I, and I said, I'd love to. And he says, see if you can drag George out here with you. I said, there you go. I'll talk to him. Hit you him see? up. Let's go. I think we should go before we do the show. Let's go. Let's go next Monday before we do the show. All right. So I'm playing with, with Angelo. When? Today? Today. Oh, after this? Yeah. Ah. And uh, Ryan, who I met with, uh, Eddie Van Halen. Mm. I rest his soul. So Eddie Van Halen brought Ryan. He goes, hey, can I bring like a bud? I said, yeah, bring my buddy. And uh, when he passed, we decided that we were going to stay friends because Eddie brought us together. Very difficult to have Eddie go, man. Yeah. You know, Because you meet a guy and you're like, man, you know, like you and I, we just initially clicked. You meet a guy, you click. Forget about that. He's one of your idols uh, growing up. But that he just likes the things that you like, and he's maybe he's he was home a lot. I was home a lot, but golf or whatever was great. Went on trips and stuff. But you know, you can meet somebody, you can know somebody forever and not feel a connection, or you can meet mm -hmm. somebody like you and I, you just met, sure, and you're right from the beginning it's connected. Real. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, are you still on it, or do you? Do you uh, you know, I'm on, uh, so I went off it for a while. I took it for maybe six, seven months, felt like it didn't work as well for me anymore, and then went into, um, now I'm on Zoloft. Okay. Which is, like, fine. I don't love uh, it. I mean, it's always a, a dance. There's a, there's a line in a movie, and this is for Gil. It was a wonderful movie that Ice Cube and uh, Chris Tucker uh, did, <laughs> and it was called Friday. Oh, yeah. It was a wonderful movie. It's a great movie. The first time I saw it, I laughed. I couldn't believe I was laughing this hard. Oh, yeah. And one of the famous lines is, I know you don't smoke weed, but today's Friday, <sighs> and you ain't got shit to do, and we're going to get uh, fucked up. Oh, my God. So, Gil, I know you don't smoke weed. I know this. But it's Monday, so this... Is called bliss. For, for the listening audience, George just pulled out like a Willy Wonka grab bag of weed. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. Okay. So, um, can you define what bliss is for us? Uh, sure. So, looking at is a dosist bliss pen. Uh, it's supposed to be like a vaporizer oh. pen, uh, disposable, I believe. Nine to uh, so fifty doses, so fifty hits you can take off it. Uh, 9 to 1 THC to CBD ratio. You're familiar with that at all? So THC, yeah. like the psychoactive stuff, CBD is the stuff that has a lot more just like medical yeah. benefits. You can like rub it on your knee if it hurts. Uh, so that's that's this bad boy. But I that imagine. was supposed to make you happy? Is that is that happy? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a little bit branding. It's not like okay. it'll get you high and you'll probably be happy because of it, but that's this Okay, guy. Gil, there's option one. All right, number one. Uh, number two, uh, super pure CBD oil. 
Uh, da, 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 da. So this is pure CBD oil. I don't think any any THC in here. No. So this is pure. Um, you know, you can sort of take it for pa aches and pains. And does that prepare general. you sick a beef stick up your culo? Wait a minute. Nothing. <laughs> nothing will prepare you. For this this one will. Uh, Gil, this is our third choice. All right. So we have the Dosist Arouse. It's the same brand as the other one, is the Bliss. That one will put, make a beef stick go right between your oil <laughs> and your <laughs> cheeky <laughs> gum. There you go. Uh, same deal, 50 doses, just a little bit more THC than the other one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this one. What else we got? All right. Sorry, uh, Gil, I hit that in front of you. Relief, uh, very similar. Uh, two to one THC to CBD. What's that? So this one, so the last one was ten to one. This is two God to damn. one. Which so, one? Fucking wait, uh, that bro, ten to one, which doesn't else. necessarily mean a shit ton. It just means maybe way, it could be way less CBD than the, the THC. So, but, but this one, does this one, this one, make the beef, the beef squash your, squash the beef. It, it won't be squashed when you're when you're on that. <laughs> but is this is this good? Is that ten to one is good or not? Ten to one is strong or not? Strong? Uh, ten to one will be. It will be. Probably about as strong as any of these, but it won't have the CBD, so it won't have the other sort of effects. Gil, arouse. Um, you know, I'm not. I'm not the next, but I just play one on the podcast. Um, Get and then relief. Real in here. We got two to one THC to CBD. So this one does have a lot of CBD in it as well as THC. So you're just okay. You're getting a little bit of everything in here. This one is. It's called. This would be for relief. So I think they want like, for example, if you're like, you know, hanging out at home and oh my, my knees killed me and my shoulders killing me, that might be a good one. For I just you. put some ointment on my on my finger this morning. There you go. Did it work? Yeah. Okay. You could throw this in the trash. You could do whatever. I'm just gonna put it over there because I know you have, you know, problems with pain. Next up. I'm not saying take it. Yeah. I'm not saying anything. All right. I'm okay. just saying. Well, then maybe Offici this. Officially, I'm not, I'm not going to yeah. use it. I'm not going to take it. <laughs> okay. I'm going to put it right, mira, right there, Switzerland, right in the middle, right there. And there we All go. Right. Uh, so Calm, another Dosis pen. It uh, wouldn't even stay up. That's oh. this one. So the one, Arouse, the, the, the beef one there, that'll, that's a 10 to 1 THC to CBD. This is a 1 to 10 THC to CBD. CBD. So this one is mostly CBD. Yeah. So in terms of your, your pains and whatnot and not wanting to get too fucked up, this is probably your guy. Yeah. So I will, if you want to switch your that. I, I can't believe that you use the F word. I'm, so, I'm sorry. This is, right. a, this is a Christian podcast. There's one more. Uh, and then lastly, sleep. So this is a 8 to 1 THC to CBD. And probably my guess would be that it's uh, in indica, which if that means that there's indicas and there's sativas are the two sort of varieties of, of THC. Indica, the general idea is like in the couch. It's the relaxing one, hang out at home. Sativa, that's the more like heady, high, creative, whatever. In the couch. In the couch. That's that, you know, that's what that's how they explained it to me because nobody yeah. could ever tell what's the difference between indica and sativa. They yeah. go indica in the couch. Exactly. So this one has a good amount of THC, but will probably be a, a good knockout. You know, what? I took a little hit of that bliss one, man, and I'm already feeling feeling pretty blissed out. So you're starting to get out of focus. <laughs> I'm a little bit. I'm a little. To bit, me, a little blurry. Yeah, I'm a little bit tripping, just on that little thing. Okay, and these are. Oh, there's more. Yeah. I okay. Can't, I can't. Uh, you could be here for. I, you know what? My eyes are going. Hey, I think the Lexapro is making me not be able to see. I just went to the eye doctor before coming down here today. What do you say? Uh, one of my eyes is starting to. <laughs> so this is the it's, dentist. It's changed. So give me a new prescription. In just one eye? Yeah. So is this a? The other eye is just as strong. Huh. Oh, so this is. Um, Flower. They say. I think this is just a dropper, actually. What? Let me see. A little dropper. God damn I don't even know. I think you might. This would probably like rip off the tab and drop it tabs on your tongue. But what? this is. So it's like CBD oil, I'm pretty sure is what this is. Uh. And it's sativa. So that's a. It's Jack Herer, which is actually a really popular strain. I know uh, Seth Rogen calls it his working weed. I've heard that before. Uh, it's good for the creativity. Uh, you know, for when you're writing your novel, it yeah. is really that. It, and it hits everyone different, but I know for a lot of people, they do like that. All right. So that's this that. one's Gil. Got some more oil. This is a uh, Girl Scout cookie, uh, which is a hybrid, uh, and also <laughs> Girl Scout. Cookie. Yeah, Girl Scout cookie, and it also super popular. Does one. it taste like Girl Scout cookie? Um, I, don't I don't know if the oil will, but I've I've smoked the actual one before, and it it, it tastes it's very like. All right, so yeah. so open that up. So people, that how how, how do you? So I see. What you, is it? If you look on the very end, there's like a little tab, but I'm pretty sure you pull off, and then you can like probably squeeze that to like oh. blot out some drops. You don't put them in your eye, doesn't that? You do not put that okay. in your eye. That would, that would probably require another optometrist house. Want to smell that? Um, I'm, trying smell to, that? I'm, I'm trying to think. Of, it looks like what we. 
<laughs> we have to drive them home. No, they're but, nice but, but but um, let's say this. Let's say let's say. I mean, one of the things about this podcast that sticks in my mind is when Be Real was here and you were here, and we were talking about. First of all, you you were you were surprised on how knowledgeable Be Real was on, on everything. Knowledgeable, personable, articulate. I, I was thoroughly impressed. How, how He's much? He's a gondrepreneur. I don't know if he dropped that term, but that's, is that what they call it? We people who do the weed business. Okay. Yeah. I just ha. looked at one of his things today. He was uh, he was rapping and saw a little bongo player and he was rapping. He's good. His voice, that nasal, yeah. that he said that na like they said, hey man. I think they, he was fucking around with it and found it. The night of your show that uh, we went to see you up in West Hollywood, they were playing music. And there's this one song going out, and, and I'm not into the rap stuff, you know. I, I'm an oldies guy, but this thing's going on. But I, I was a musician, and so I liked it. Hey, I said this, this, and my daughter says, "Dad, you like?" It? I said, "Yeah, this guy, this this stuff is good." She goes, "That's be real." Oh and, shit! And it was one of his songs. Insane in the membrane. I don't know what, what was it. Was. It? I don't the know. Rock stars. Wanna be a rock? Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. We got, we got plenty. Sir. Okay. Okay. It, it, Ooh. You know, Grape Ape. So I've not heard of this one before, but it's a uh, so Grape Ape, more oil. Um, it says evening and, oh, it says indica. So this is probably just an indica too. So okay. good one for the evenings. Let's talk about when, when you were an officer. Uh-huh. But you didn't, you didn't pull anybody over. You, 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 were, or you were uniform. You were I'm uniform. A, I started. started okay. Off. Let's talk about when you were when you were uniform. How different was your was your job being uniform as being a detective? Oh, difference in night and day. When you're in uniform, you're essentially what they call arrest oriented. So you got criminals, you arrest them, and that's all you care about. You're taking bad guys off the streets. When you're a detective, you're prosecution oriented. So now they're in custody, or the report's been written. Now you're worried about getting them prosecuted. So it's a whole different. Did you game. know that? No, I didn't know what this is. It's okay. a whole different game. And then the sheriff's, what, are, what, are the, what is the sheriff's jurisdiction? We have... Uh, because Andy Griffith, was like, he couldn't go to Mount Pilot. No, this... There, he could only no, be in Mayberry. There in, is no difference between yeah. us <laughs> and LAPD. We're both uh, two of the largest agencies in the uh, United States today. And we do everything the same type of police work. We have patrol. We have, I believe it's now up to 22 different substations. We are responsible for patrolling all the unincorporated areas of Los Angeles County to include incorporated cities that contract with the Sheriff's Department. So let us say, like the city of uh, Compton, they're an incorporated city. They don't have their own police department. Uh, they did have their own police department one time. They chose to pull away from that for whatever reason they had at that time, and they've asked the sheriff's department to step on in. So now they have a contract with the sheriff's department, so we do their police work. They don't have any more Compton Police Department? No. Okay. I think in a, in a Biggie Tupac uh, documentary at that time, they did have Compton Police, and I think they may have. Yes. Just they for did. corruption and... Yes. Yeah. There, 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 was, there were some problems. And some cities, let us say Hawthorne Police Department, they have their own police department, they're an incorporated city, but whenever they have an officer-involved shooting or a murder, then they bring in sheriff's homicide ah. to do it because it's a specialty. Interesting. And, and we do that. Okay, so let's say Hawthorne, they're more into the just maintaining peace. They're more into regular patrol duties. Regular patrols. So, you know, And if they have a, ki a murder... They're not equipped. They're they're not the people that you would want. No, they don't have the man the right way. They, well, don't the, have, they, they just don't have the, have the manpower, and they don't have the time. To, the they don't have the time to dick to dedicate to the murder itself. It takes it. It's it's not like TV. It, it takes hours and hours and a lot of dedication. You have to have the logistical power to wherewithal to do it. So. Uh, when somebody gets killed and you know he ran to New York, uh, well, you tell I just tell my people, hey, I need to go to New York. Well, here it is, go. You don't have the ability to do that in a smaller city. They they still have everyday crime that they have to worry about. They don't have the time to dedicate to murder investigation. Okay, so um, Gianni Versace, yes, was was murdered on the steps of his of his. Uh, 
mansion in Miami. Yes. He had gotten out, walked down, no bodyguard. I think he had security, but he di- didn't take security. There's a there's a kid from, you know, San Diego, Andrew Cunanan, probably a, a sociopath murder. What is it, a psychopath? Sociopath? Sociopath. Liar, made his life bigger than it was, said he came for everybody. Had a different story for everybody else. Sure. Um... Lied to his, didn't see his mom, his dad in the Philippines. I think his dad was almost the same way, a trait that his dad had. Was arrested, left the United States, fled, couldn't come back to the United States. But then he, the Kunan had to kill somebody in Minneapolis, a, a, somebody he was kind of dating, went over there, killed him, or killed a friend, wrapped him up in the body, the thing they thought. Then he, then he moved to Chicago and had a, he was kind of like a guy that would go with older older people. So now you have a murders in two different uh cities, maybe three oh he shot a shot a like a funeral like a cemetery caretaker took his car along the way. So you have three murders. And I think in jurisdictions back then they had a flyer that they had made in Miami and and the for whatever reason the FBI in Miami or the police d- didn't put it out. Like in gay clubs or things like that. Like 3,000 of them, they probably would have, who knows, would have caught him before because he was still going out. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, he walked up on Versace, never saw it coming, and then shot him, and then he, he went into some caretakers. A lot of people rolled over on him once he got Versace. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I don't know anything about this story. Do you have beef with Versace, or what was the idea there? You know what, man? There? I don't remember. All I remember is during that case, I was contacted by the news media. They wanted to, ask, they wanted to interview me a few times on the Versace case, especially how it would be going, what they would be doing. And there was no doubt. I remember the last time they interviewed me, excuse me, I said, uh, I believe they'll have them within three days now. They were closing in on them, and mm-hmm. there was enough information there. So they were they were very competent. They were doing what everything was right. And, and the pressure of the world was on them because it had worldwide media attention. Yes. Because of him being Mr. Versace. So... Um I think they may have met at a club in San Francisco briefly. Depends on who. I think they may have crossed paths, but to him, it was a bigger thing than it was. Like he would say to his friends, oh, I met Versace last night and he invited me to his fashion show. Do you know if either one of them liked those beef sticks? I, I think maybe. <laughs> I, going by the way that Kunanen was living, he might have <laughs> got to the liquor store and got a couple of those. those, those, those uh, he was up in Canyon Country. The flamboyant, uh, the fabulous beef sticks that I was seasoning <laughs> myself over. Oh, but but uh, uh, I think, yeah, I think I, he got seasoning. But yeah, in someone's mind, how they become fixated on somebody, you know, like a mean higher patrolman. If, I don't think if the higher patrolman would have been allegedly nicer to us, I would have I would have put those those sticks in my culo. That's, that's the one part of the story that was alleged. You know, it was <laughs> if he was nicer to you. Oh, you know what? I, 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 always, I, always, I always tell cops, treat people the way you'd like to be treated. <laughs> See, there they might. See, hey, you know, that's the golden rule for a reason. Hey, I, 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 know some, I know some guy that I consider a very good friend now. He told me, for you could learn. <laughs> hey, so, you, I mean, I, but, but also, he never went and got, tried a different flavor either. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like 20 years later, he's like, why Why doesn't any beef stick taste as good yeah. as the ones from back in I the I remember day. the old days. Yeah. Uh, back this when it was in the open container. Okay, this one looks Ooh, like this? something you leave at the, a sample you leave at the doctor's. What, what is that one? Oh, we got a, another piece of paraphernalia hey, here. Hey, Gil, I can't see up close anymore. What is this? No. This, I honestly, no. is this a joke? Yeah, well, well, I wear glasses. I can't see you. Uh, the Lex Pro effect. I think, I, I, said, I, no, I think the first, yeah. thing, first time I first thing, oh, it's probably a pen. Oh, okay, probably about forty five years of age. I went to go get uh, LASIK forty five, pretty close. I would, I did that LASIK surgery, and uh, I remember telling the doctor. He said, "Doc, you can do this on Saturday morning." I said, "How long is it going to take?" Because uh, my eyes need to be clear. I right? I'm on call. And yeah. He, he says, "Okay." He says, "Well, normally I'd make you come back on Monday." So I. But he says, we'll do yours first thing in the morning on Saturday. Come back 5 o'clock in the afternoon. We'll take a look. So my daughter drove us down there. My wife had it done, too. And so my wife drove us, my daughter drove us down there in the morning, had it done. She drove us back. I went back that afternoon, Saturday afternoon. 
and they took the patches off my eye and psh, it worked it was beautiful it was beautiful i could see it was great i told my daughter give me the keys to the car she says dad i'll drive i said give me the keys to the car <laughs> i got you're not these you're not gonna out. be you're not gonna be with me tonight if i get called out on a murder give me the keys to the car she gave me the keys to the car we drove out and i got to the first signal and i started screaming is it red is it green is it red is it green <laughs> 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 and, the, and they started screaming and i just started laughing oh man uh, so by the way, this is a is a pen. I wasn't sure if it, what it was at first, but there's another sort of like vape pen that is 93% CBD. So mostly uh, CBD, the non psychoactive oh. stuff, but uh, a lot of THC. Or sorry, a lot of CBD. But well, that, that much more THC. Okay, so that'll be a good. Um, I have to find out. I have to find out when my when my balm is coming out. Mm. You know, because yours work good too. It works. The only drawback to yours was it, it, it smelled like Vicks. You know, so if you're trying to keep I, it a secret, I think. I think I think we're trying to convince Vix to buy it before it comes out, but but uh, no, I think it, it it works. It works. I gave it to someone who's a musician, very famous in Miami, that asked for refills, and I don't think I would ever refill anybody. But I'm not a pharmacy, but I did for him because you know. But it even comes with its own cradle. Okay, so I'm gonna use I'm gonna use two of these, and we'll talk about it next week. Do you want Do you want any of this? Uh, so you can take part. I'm sure. going to use the Bliss yeah. because of the Lexapro. Maybe I need a higher. I'm going to use the Bliss, and I'm going to use the Sleep, which I have one right here. I think you ought to use your Roz and let us go buy you some beef sticks. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm going to use the I'll, and, and next week beef jerky. And the Hor Horvath company, and then next uh, Horvath, and then next uh, week. I'm going to come with some beef sticks everybody can enjoy at your leisure. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go to Costco and buy the same ones. I'll make sure those things are vacuum sealed. Yeah, though. they got to be Jimmy sealed. John's. <laughs> um, and the sleep one. Oh, wait. This one is... Do a little research. Take, take, take notes when you're on. Make sure we get good data here. Relief. Okay. I'm going to try the bliss and the sleep one. And then we'll talk about it next next week sounds good all right we got a little time if you want to do any uh yeah any, let's do some do voicemails or articles all right yeah. cool and let's also do voicemails. uh well all right we'll start with the voicemails throw on the cans uh and cool news i i know we talked about this a little bit but um so this episode will be airing august 9th and uh, during that week we will be featured on the amazon music Times square billboard what so this art will be the the Is art Gil gonna be on there too? Um, and we had to submit it before we had the Gil oh. art, unfortunately. So, Gil, you will not be there. Oh, God. Um, but, I mean, I didn't know this before we started doing the promotion. You can get podcasts on Amazon Music. You can oh. even tell, if you have an Alexa, you can tell them, like, you know, Alexa, play the podcast OMG High with George Lopez on Amazon Music. And I got those. Playing. You have those in the house? Yeah. I, get, I do. Oh, it's great. It's great, isn't it? Yeah, but I like, but I like watching the YouTube. I like I'm... I start laughing and I laugh at myself. <laughs> well, you know, I, I listen. I, I got to tell you, man. I mean, you know, Brian was just here like maybe three episodes, but when Gil took over, it became a you, you made it a different podcast, right? Oh yeah. What's different about it? Um, it's just more the vibe. I mean, it's it's hard to nail down, but like people, I, I, I look at the YouTube comments. I shouldn't because that's a terrible place to be, but like. Every time it's like, oh fucking! If you're gone, it's like, where the fuck is Gil? And if you're here, it's like, oh, Gil, yeah. Gil's back, baby. No, I know, but they, yeah, and no, I mean, you talked about the guy that criticized, but I think more people like this. I think I don't know. I don't oh, know yeah. how many. Oh, no doubt, more people haters, they really. like, yeah, the show. But if you if you're not if you don't have haters, I mean, I, I would hate to be a hater. I used to be a hater, but I would hate to be somebody that spent time wishing other people harm. Uh, yeah, I, it was some NBA player. I want to say like Chris. Chris Bosch or something like that, and he was talking about how he dealt with a lot of hate coming up, and he just started to treat it as like math. He's like, if I'm going to be on this big a stage, like, there's no way everyone's going to like me. And if we're yeah. in a group of five people, not everyone's going to like me. That, that's that's the absolute truth, you know. And I I, I get it because there were a lot of haters as I was coming up. You know, well, yeah. as a matter of fact, if you look at the documentary, there were haters that didn't think that it was one person. Yeah, and they yeah. they made fun of you. And I think you went easy when they said they would they would tease you, but I, I'm pretty sure the way police tease is not as simple as you made it sound. Well, the only one, you know, <laughs> the, the guys in my department uh, in my homicide bureau, there was only a couple of guys that came and got in my face. Uh, and there was the one agency in particular, and I had a friend on the inside. 
And he says, Gil, every time you walk out, they're motherfucking mm-hmm. you up to one side and down the other. They were sincere. And there was a sergeant, I want to say his name was O'Connor, the night of uh, July the 7th when Sophie Dickman got hit. And the informant, which was right, lived right across the street from Sophie Dickman, she was a member of the Sheriff's Department. She did work our crime lab. Yes. And she was on the documentary. That's Lin- right. She- Linda Arthur. And I got there, and she lived across the street. And I got the message, call her up. I go, she got to come down here. Sophie Dickman just got hit. I think it's related. So I go down, and I'm standing across the street, out of their crime scene, out of their way. And that sergeant saw me, and he came on over. And the first words out of his mouth were, what the fuck are you doing here? Wow. And I just said, oh, good morning to you, too. You know, and I never let him see that it bothered me, anything wow. like that. Mm. Fortunately, uh, his captain was there with him. His captain was a little bit embarrassed. He said, come on in, we'll let you take a look right now. But uh, they were, you know, and they were led by the leader of that department. I won't mention his name, but he was the leader. He knows who he is. And he just wanted his department to solve the case. We were big brother to him. Yeah. And the the smaller department wanted to solve the case, and what he didn't realize is we didn't care who solved it as long as it was solved. Well, I think that's. I mean, if you if you listen to Be Real, which I yeah. I would, he would say that you don't fuck with the sheriffs and the LAPD. Yeah. You you're like iffy on them, like whatever. So yeah. if they're trying to solve the crime to be uh, big in the in in whatever, you just want to solve the crime. They did not have the manpower or the or the logistical power to to do it. They just didn't. When you talk about how many murders there were, how big their department is, we had people we could staff all over the county. They didn't. You know, they, they could take care of How this. about this? How about in the, the Manson case, when they were leaving, they changed clothes, and they were on Mulholland, and they threw the clothes over, and it was a reporter from ABC that said, okay, so if they left, let's get in the car, and let me change clothes in the car and let me see at what point are we where they would throw the clothes out the window and then they look over and there's the fucking clothes down the hill. And that is like your mother-in-law finding <laughs> finding something that you did wrong and she found it for you. You know that? You <laughs> hate it. But it's, it's somebody like that investigator just think that that reporter thinking outside the box. Hey, let's try. What is it going to cost me other than time? And they found, and you know, when the police, when the LAP showed up there, they go, well, how did you uh, find uh, find out? It guys like, you know, there was somebody that, you know, had some inside information. I mean, the reporter just said, let me get in the back, let me change clothes. And there they, and there it was. They yeah. were the clothes. A real, a real homicide investigator, and he's now dead, a guy named Charlie Gunther, who's one of my heroes. You know, he, he's an old guy, uh, short sleeves, and he rolled his sleeves up, wore taps <laughs> on his wingtip shoes. You know, always had a piece of tobacco or a, mm-hmm. or a cigarette or a cigar in his mouth. And he didn't care who solved what crime. And he, when the Night Stalker case, once we had an arrest, they had private investigators helping him out. Now, he's, the investigators on the defense side of this case. Charlie Gunther had an unsolved case, and he comes up to one of the investigators, hey, you got some free time? I'd like you to take a look at this. Just give me a, a fresh view. Because he didn't have all the answers, and you take help yeah. from wherever you can yeah. get it. Those cops that think they're too good, you know, hey, you're a reporter. What do you know? Well, you, you know, you, you take any advice you can. Last point, but but you know, in Mine Hunter, whatever that that guy wrote a book, but they they you know they had to convince the FBI or convince law enforcement mm-hmm. that you could prevent a crime before it happened, instead of being reactive with the right information, following traits. Right, I guess. Am I am I close? I don't know. I've never been able to, yeah. You know, prevent prevent something other than an obvious gang murder. You know, this this body hit this body, and you know who got hit over here. And you know, well, you know that they're going to retaliate. Right. So now you focus over here. So when these guys come across the line, you get them before they shoot. Okay. That you know, you know what's going to happen. But aside from that, I don't see how okay. you can stop it. Ballot. All right. All right. Voicemails. Uh, George, pop pop quiz now that you got some of that uh, weed in you. What's the voicemail number? Shit. 818-533-1843. I can never. <laughs> 818. I'm dyslexic. I can. Five, three, you think you would have it in here. 538. 818. Oh, yeah. Just call. Leave voicemail for, for George. Gail to answer. Well, you know, what do you want people to ask about? We got all over the board. But Let's ask some questions for Gil. Life. We got some questions for Gil. 818-533-1843. I don't know. I can't remember that. All right. Here's the first one. Away we go. Uh, just leave it right there. I see it right there on the screen. 
Hola, Jorge. Big fan. I have a question. I am happily married, but about once or twice a year, I get this crazy urge to fuck somebody else, like cheat on my husband straight up. Wow. What the fuck is wrong with me? Am I just a puta or is this normal? Like, is this normal? He's the best guy ever. I don't know what is wrong. What do you think is wrong? Is this normal or am I fucked up? Thanks. Love you know, that. I don't know who that is, but I already want to invite her to my who me to my puta. <laughs> <laughs> Am I a puta or what? I think. Can I? Can we hear it again? That that's just oh, yeah. such a li listen. I I am not sure. It. I'm not sure why I've been neglecting voicemails. If they're going to be like that, um, that's a good voicemail. That it, is it, a it really is a very honest lady. Yeah. And I, I love the honesty. Listen, yeah. if there's if there's any place for a Latino to be honest. It is on that. What's the number, Gil? Hey, it is. With your eyes. 818-533-8143. Let's hear it again. 1843. 1843. God, on. Leave that up there. <laughs> Throw it on screen. The, Hor the, the number to the Horvath University hotline. Right, you want to hear it again, you This said? is the Horvath University hotline. <laughs> How can I help you? Here we go. Oh, sorry. From the top. Bless this putissima. I love her. Putissima is a great one. Grand, come on, motherfucker. Shit. Hit. It's not quite. <laughs> Hola, Jorge. Big fan. I have a question. I am happily married, but about once or twice a year, I get this crazy urge to fuck <laughs> somebody else. Like, cheat on my husband straight up. Like, what the fuck is wrong with me? Am I just a or is this normal? Like, is this normal? He's the best guy ever. I don't know what is wrong. What do you think is wrong? Is this normal or am I fucked up? Thanks. <laughs> I think... <laughs> Did she answer her own question? <laughs> Uh, no, but what, what, what do you think, George? What's uh, what, what are the thoughts on the matter? I'm not George. Don't look at me. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you, you don't have to speak from experience. This can be a purely academic I, exercise. What? I, well, I, I think she's a very nice lady. Myself, she's trying to help society and her own personal problems out. I mean, what? It, it, I mean, you know, there's some people that bring other things into the relationship. I mean, you know, maybe, maybe. You know what? Maybe her husband has the same idea that every once in a while he wouldn't mind banging somebody else. Hey, she's happily married. If this is going to keep her happily married, I, God bless her. I don't know how you would present it to your husband, but I'm not sure. Listen, I was married for 17 years. They might trick you. Van said, what if we brought somebody else into the bedroom? And I said, yeah, that'd be great. Then you were like, motherfucker. <laughs> that was a trick question. <laughs> I, I, I got nothing to say because I'll tell you right now, if my wife <laughs> listens to this and listens to me laughing, she's, <laughs> she's not going to be happy. We're going to cut you out of this part right here. But but I, I think that you would almost, um, man, I, Grant, I don't know. what you Do what, Do you talk to your husband about it and say, listen, uh, I mean, may, maybe a marital aid, a toy, a <laughs> porn? So, some things need just a whole lot of leave alone. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No, you but I mean, it. I think her question ultimately was like, you know, am I fucked up? And I think the answer is pretty much like, no. No. Like, that's, no. A, that's a pretty natural thing. Sure. Like, sure. forever's a long time. Monogamy is is a you know it's an agreement it's it's not right. really yeah. the way we're wired. Monogamy's good. I always like Park Place. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like the boardwalk. <laughs> so so yes, I think that's a good point. It, is that it's a contract? It's not. It's not necessarily how we're built either. Like it's not how people are built. You, you know, and so, I, I'm a modern guy. It's like I, you can get away with whatever everyone agrees with. I think. So don't don't think that that you're fucked up because you're not. That's to, right. To that wonderful lady that called. No. If you eat the same ice cream every day, you get tired of the same ice cream, even if it's ice you, cream. Yeah. So I would say I would say ultimately, no, that it's almost healthy to have that identity. I'm not sure if you have a partner like let's see that you know that what her husband thinks, but there's people I think that step out, you know, swingers or or, or maybe they say, Just don't embarrass me. You used to hear that. Yeah. Well and I think I think it was my therapist who told me too. It's like it's not the it, it's not the first thought that matters, right? Like, it's it's what you do with it, right? If a part of you is like, suddenly like, fuck, I want to cheat. And you're like, wait a second. I'm not going to do that. I love this person. 
That's what matters. Anybody out there with the same thought, call 818-533-1843. <laughs> I don't know, but okay, but can we agree that she's not fucked up? No. But yeah, I don't fully think agree. Okay. Not fucked up. I think it's healthy. But then to, to a Latina or to a Latino, you think that a healthy thought is fucked up. I love my husband a couple times a year. I want I get the urge to fuck somebody else. What's wrong with me? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. You're not a puta. You're not a puta, <laughs> but you may be a PIT, a puta in training. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, next. Moving right along. More <laughs> hard right. questions. Here we go. Hi, George. This is Jane. And I just have a quick question for both you and Gil. What's your take on Jeffrey Epstein's death? Do you think it was truly oh, a suicide? Great question. That is a great question. You know, on it, on its face with the things that went on uh, in the beginning, and we only know what you and everybody else in the public knows, but it's certainly extremely suspicious to an old investigator's eyes, you know, about it being a suicide. There's not enough information pushed out. I don't know what they're holding back, but I would say no. Uh, cellmate removed, cameras uh, being worked on. An operative, sir. They're, they're Something like the guys who were watching him were on their, like, fourth consecutive shift or something like that, so yeah. basically asleep or something. Yeah, so I, I don't think, uh, I would say no. I don't all, think all, I'm subject to being wrong. Also, on a, in, in Russia, Vladimir Putin alleged someone was taken out on a bridge. Uh, they jumped over the bridge, and the cameras were being repaired that weekend, and there was no footage of the guy, you know, had enough of his life and jumped over the bridge. And, um, you know, I think Jeffrey Epstein alleged the first time it didn't work, and then the second time, but clearly, let's see with the female uh, Maxwell that's in custody, Yes. if anything happens to her, or, I mean, listen, uh... They know a lot of names. Let's see if she oh, calls yeah. in to ask if she's a puta. Yeah. Hi, George. I used to be with Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> we would take that call. That would be uh, a great Giselle <laughs> Maxwell. Is that how you La say Ma that name? La Maxwell. Gislaine it's a, it's a Maxwell. It's, it's the she's a graduate of Harvard University in <laughs> Sherman Oaks, California. Established <laughs> in 1978. I mean, she's got jizz in her name. Come on. We got to do the Horvath University t-shirt, too. I, that, that feels like good merch, the Horvath stuff. Uh, Gil, I don't know why you're not puffing on one of these, because I've already taken three puffs. I'm already trying to figure out what I'm going to do tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more? No, right. five more? Uh, we, got, we got time. Here we go. A couple more. Um, all right, next up. Oh, volume helps. I think I'm sucking out. Okay. You even got a cradle. Anybody want a beef jerky while we're waiting? <laughs> Grant? Cabrona. What up, George? This is Ben from North Carolina. Just saying, there was a stand-up comedian named Tim Wilson that a lot of road comedians in the South really enjoyed, but he passed away in, like, 2014. Doesn't really get any recognition. Are there any uh, stand-up comedians you met on your way up or, like, in the 90s, 2000s era that nobody knows about but all the comedians loved or, like, you loved specifically? Just that. Uh, Oh man, that's oh, that's a great question. You know what? I think I knew Tim Wilson. Yeah, uh, I, saw, I saw you nodding during the uh, the voicemail there. Um, I think I, you know what? I, if it's who I think it is, I one name that comes to mind. Did you ever have any experience with Freddie Soto? I feel like he was a lot of people's sort of uh, Freddie comic Soto. Yeah, I did not know Tim Wilson, but. Uh, yeah, you know, a lot of those guys, Rodney Carrington, still living, but was uh, incredibly successful in a, a genre like in the South. And then when my show was on ABC, he had a deal to do a show at ABC and it didn't work out. Um, so, you know, he's incredibly successful, but it's, it's hard to take, you know, somebody that is, there's no guarantee that if you're successful, that it will translate to TV. Mm -hmm. You know, Jeff Foxworthy was... A, had an incredible has had an incredible career oh, yeah. and had a show on NBC and it and it didn't work. Uh, Tim Wilson, I did not know, but Freddie Soto uh, had a show. I mean, Freddie Soto was on the way up. He was out there when I was when I was doing it, and I think that Freddie Soto would have been somebody that people would have 
heard of. You know, incredibly charismatic, um, charming dude, good dude. I think he OD'd. I think he... Yeah, it was, it was something tragic. I know it was something tragic. Yeah. I'm, I'm really surprised uh, Angela Johnson. Right. Good entertainer, good, good-looking good young lady. Yes. Very articulate, very sharp, former Raiderette. I'm really surprised that, you know, for whatever the reason, because I don't know the business at all, but I would think that she would have transitioned into something more than stand-up, just what she's doing. You know, I think I would agree. I mean, Angela Johnson has always been incredibly charismatic, wonderful personality, comes across on stage, uh, attractive, did her work, has done her time. And, um, you know, there's, there's, well, I mean, it's hard to say, but I would think that if you look at uh, Tim Allen, when Tim Allen, before he had a show, he, mm-hmm. he got involved with Matt uh, Williams, who created the show. Um, Drew Carey was uh, was uh, successful in his show, mm-hmm. and he was with Bruce Helford. I, you know, would say, hey, where's my Bruce Helford? Bruce Helford and I did my first show, and I think maybe, you know, having a showrunner that is of that caliber makes a huge difference, mm. and I think that when comedians are coming up, if you don't have a, a showrunner of a particular caliber, it's like going into a gunfight with a knife. Mm-hmm. You want it, you don't want to show up with a knife. But also, you think that if you hold out, maybe you don't find somebody better, maybe there's not a better deal. But I can't speak for Angela, but I would, I would be surprised what her story would be if we brought her in here and we asked, sure. why aren't you, you know, haven't had either a movie career or a TV career. Not that she hasn't, doesn't have a great career, but if you, I think you would ask her, every comedian aspires to be a star of their own show. And a very personable lady. Yep. You were invited backstage, got to meet her. She, just a wonderful uh, wonderful lady and great entertainer. Yeah. And, I think and that, she's got that Latina accent if she wants to go the Latina side. I, I, think that that's, I think that that's part of it. Like, you know, and that, you know, nail salon, bon cuique. Oh. Bon uh, uh, oh, God, that is hilarious. I mean... Sometimes that's sometimes that's enough to to get through. Yeah, but that was a great question. Good really question. Like that, one. that was a good question. Yes. Cool. Uh, do you want to wrap it up? No, let's do. Want to do more? One more for Gil. All right. This is a good show, huh, Gil? Yeah, it is. I, I, I that question. This uh, Gil, this one's for you. These bastards aren't playing. One sec. Am I gonna go golf? Yeah. What time is it? Oh yeah. I better. Three fifty. I think I would have fucking brought my sticks over here. Better not. My palos. Like. You guys hear anything? It's, I'm not hearing anything either. No. That one is uh, working. That? All right. I, I can ask that question, which was simply Sofia Vergara or Selma Hayek. That was the entirety Ooh. of the voicemail. Ooh. Uh, I don't care. Either one, either one of them or. Perla? What she's calling me. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, Selma Hayek. You know, I was. Yeah, on my show, I, th- I had a thing for some high. I put it in the show. Did you? Yeah. I put it in the show that... If I had my show, I'd put it in too. <laughs> <laughs> I met her. Uh, you know you know what's funny, man, is, is you know, when you start to, when you start to have a little bit of success, you, you don't, you know, I remember she told me we were going to do a movie. We were, we, were, we were talking about doing the remake of War of the Roses. With with uh, Michael Douglas, we yeah. were married to each other, and, and we talked. You know, I talked to her about it. I went to her office, and I remember she said to me, "Cause my show got canceled, and I was, you know, in the press, not happy." And I remember she said to me, "What the fuck are you so fucking miserable about? You want to spend your fucking life in a fucking stage? You don't see the fucking light. You don't see your fucking life. You want to be trapped in a fucking stage?" I was like, "Oh, all right." That makes sense. You want you want to be put away for another three years when you could be yeah. doing other shit. And then the, George Clooney's office was right across from the stage at Warner Brothers. It was Ellen, it was ER. Then it became Ellen. Then George Clooney's office and mine. And one day we were on a break and we saw some couple people walking and the guard said, "That's Selma Hayek right there." And I said, "Selma!" Turned around, saw me, and started running towards me. Mm-hmm. I was eating popcorn. We had a popcorn thing. We was eating popcorn, and. I looked at the guard and the people, and I go, Selma Hayek is running toward me. <laughs> and she comes up, and she, she grabs some popcorn out of the thing, puts it on her, eats it, and then we talk a little bit, gives me a kiss, and you could taste the salt from the popcorn on the... 
So that's what I that's what I do right before I light a fire. <laughs> 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 All right. It's been a fantastic show. Gil, I love you, man. Thank I you. And you thank brother. you again, thank Grant. You. Aaron, you, you never see up over there. Fucking uh, Bosley of Charlie's Angels. <laughs> exactly. Uh, thank you, man. A lot of fun, brother. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, good. guys. See you next time.